the essence of the Lutheran Reformation is the driving force of an idea, a very basic, very important idea. And it is that idea that drives the Reformation. It's not peasant rebellions, it's not economic stress, it's not all the many things that do influence history, but in the case of the Lutheran Reformation, you have the best example you will ever have in all of history of the power of ideas. An idea drives the Reformation. Here we have then an idea, all by itself, the power of an idea. Notice the 95 Theses, they're all very careful proposition statements, ideas, interpretations, but it's all very, very intellectual, very university. Uh, this is a professor of theology, and he's dealing with a very sophisticated group in Rome who are reading his uh, commentary and understanding exactly what he is saying. October 31st, 1517 is the moment that one of the great ideas is loosed in Europe. It is one of the great democratizing ideas because the implications, once we step away from the details of this encounter, October, November, December, 1517, then it'll be 1518, 19. If we just step back for a second, the ideas here are such that if they succeed at all, they are going to break the hold of the 1,500-year-old church, the international Roman Catholic Christian church based in Rome. It is going to be broken up, and that's what happens. Now, in the long run, we all know it didn't destroy the international Roman Catholic church. The uh, church recovered by about 1600, rebuilt itself, reformed many of the practices that he's uh, criticizing, and went on to uh, create another uh, modern Roman Catholic church, still based in Rome, still headed up by a one person, and still essentially ruled from the top, which of course was going to be the opposite of the Lutheran, Calvinist, Baptist, etc. We could run through the list of all the Protestant denominations. All of those denominations are ruled by the people, by councils, elders, etc., congresses, all of it. But in Rome, there never is a real democratizing uh, of the church. They revert to strengthening the center, strengthening the hold, and so in our world we live with the knowledge of one main church in Rome and another church uh, spread around Europe in different uh, variety. Now we know that all of this is made possible by the, the printing press. There's no question that the idea that comes from Luther could not have traveled the way it did without the printing press. The papacy could very well have bottled it up if they had not had the printing press and they could have stopped the spread of the word out of this small part of Germany and arrested him and shut him up uh, the way they were going to do with Galileo uh, 90 years later, it's possible they could have stopped the spread. They stopped it in Spain, so if you think about it, one, one country that successfully stopped these ideas from coming in was Spain. Spain was never affected by the Reformation and that was because uh, the monarchy in Spain made sure that these ideas did not come into Spain. And if you're running Spain, you have an advantage. You only have two ways in, one on the French coast in the Mediterranean, one on the Atlantic coast border of France. And if you can keep control of that, you have control of the peninsula. But thanks to Mr. Gutenberg and all his friends all over Europe, Strasbourg 1440, Cologne 1464, uh, Basel, 1466, Rome. Look at the look at the years and the spread. Isn't that fascinating to see? It's in Cologne, 64, Basel, 66, Rome, 67, Venice, 69, Florence, 71, Milan, 71, Naples, 71, Lyon, 73, Krakow, Poland, 74, Bruges, uh, Westminster, 76, London, 80. Um, 200 printers in Germany by 1500. So that means at the time of the Reformation, there are 200 printers in Germany who can print these 
Uh, and by 1518, 150 books are being published in German every year. So that just shows you Germany is definitely the leader in printing at the moment of the Reformation. Now, what is the great power confrontation here that's going to take place? Why were not the powers of Europe who were in alliance with the papacy able to shut him up? Why, why couldn't they do that? Well, on one side is our professor Luther in Germany, and the other is Pope Leo in Rome. Who is Pope Leo? Well, Giovanni de' Medici. Giovanni de' Medici is Pope Leo X. And who are the Medici? Well, the Medici are one of the greatest families in Europe and probably the single most generous source of funds for the Renaissance books that are going to be uh, published and printed by 1500, probably more than any other source, meaning that the family and the representative of the family that was going to confront this sophisticated German professor in the field of theology was headed up by one of the most sophisticated men in Europe, from one of the most sophisticated families, from one of the greatest families. Here are the two Medici popes, and you'll notice that because Leo takes over in 1513 and his cousin Clement lives till 1534, essentially there is 20 years of Medici control of the papacy. This is most unusual. Uh, usually you get maybe 10 years as long as your pope lives, but in this case you have two Medici popes who are essentially running 20 years of a Medici papacy. Now, let me just show you where Giovanni is. Just take note that on the, the, the grand figure who, who establishes all the ri riches and the power is Giovanni di Bici. He's up at the top there. So he lives into the 1420s. Then his son is Cosimo, who is another brilliant Medici operator, and he essentially controls Florence in the middle of the 15th century. His son, Piero, uh, continues his work of his father, but he has a short life. And his son, Lorenzo, is what you know, the great, the great, the great Lorenzo, uh, who lives from 1449 to almost 1500. So that's those three generations. And Lorenzo has three sons, and there's one of them who's going to be Pope. Here's Cosimo, uh, here's his son, Piero, and here's his grandson, Lorenzo, that's in the National Gallery in Washington. Beautiful, beautiful likeness. And here are his three children, Piero, Giovanni, and Giuliano. So those are the people who mattered to us tonight, especially Giovanni. And so it's Giovanni versus Pope Leo. Now, you would think, if you just think for a second here about what this is all about, you would think that a very, very sophisticated man with one of the greatest educations that anybody could get at his age in Europe, in his 30s, uh, would be a worthy interlocutor with Martin Luther. You would think that he would be exactly the man who might actually sit down with Luther and say, what are the problems? What can we do? But that's not what happened. And so if we think in our minds about the Renaissance and the Renaissance at its peak, which would be the Medici, circa 1500. And we think about the Reformation in Germany at its peak in 1517 with Luther, what we run into is a puzzle. How is it that the product of the Renaissance is not able to maneuver or encounter theological dissent from a priest in Germany successfully. How is, this, how is this possible? And we should all think about that because we've all studied the Renaissance, we've all studied the Reformation, and so here tonight we're confronting the puzzle of the fact that the Renaissance in Italy, in Florence, in Rome, did not produce someone who could meet this professor and argue his points and, and achieve some kind of accord. Why? Well, because the Renaissance had no content about democratic participation. It isn't there. It's, 
it's brilliant, it's sophisticated, it can bring a book from Alexandria to Constantinople to Italy to Florence and produce that book for Lacombe's. But it isn't anywhere in the dogma uh, democratic reform. It's just not there. So this man, in 1517, at the peak of the church, reacts to Luther with rage and anger that he would dare challenge him and turns immediately to the secular arm, which would be Holy Roman Emperor in, in uh, Germany, and would try to get Luther arrested. It's one of the very first things that happens. Here is a parliament of the powers of Germany coming together in the city of Worms, uh, that would be near Bonn in the Rhineland, and Luther is summoned before them with a promise of safe conduct to the farm and back at the demand of the Duke of Saxony. So, okay, they promise. So Luther comes. Behind the scenes, the Pope is maneuvering to have him arrested and executed. So how about that? For the reality of the confrontation between the peak of the Reformation and the peak of the Renaissance in Rome, that there's no basis for these two leaders to sit down and talk about things together. Those of you in the room, must have questions, thoughts, observations, so uh, give them to me while we keep this nice picture up here. Joel's asking, how does the Pope get to this position? Well, first of all, let's keep this in mind, and, we, and we've studied this, so we kind of know this. Uh, go back to Council of Constance, right? So that's 1400. So what we know uh, in our own studies here is that in 1400, Europe was ripped apart, uh, there were two. There was a schism. The church was ripped in half, and so um, the uh, solution was a, a council at Constance, and they decide to uh, end the schism and choose one person. Now, now what that did was give more power to Rome than it had ever had before. Why? Because the church had been through this terrible hundred-year schism and it didn't ever want it to happen again. So it said to this new man they chose, please clean up Rome, make it strong, make it solid, and, and get the church organized around you in Rome. And so that's what happens from 1400 to 1500. Pope after pope after pope after pope is chosen from among very distinguished churchmen. So one had been the head of the Franciscan order, and, and, and noteworthy for his brilliant leadership of the Franciscan order all during the 1400s, he becomes Pope. So, you know, that would be a pretty good recommendation. And others come from inside having served a variety of Popes. And so by 1500, Joel, you have one, two, three men with 30 years of, of experience in church administration being chosen by a college of cardinals because of that. So you have Borgia, Alexander Borgia. Oh my God, the shivers go down your spine. I can see all of you. Oh my God, Borgia. Oh my God, people dying, sex everywhere. Right? Jeremy Irons, sex everywhere. He's the Borgia Pope. Uh, but they chose him in... 1490, because he was such a brilliant church administrator. He'd been administering this huge church for like 30 years. He'd been a cardinal for 30 years, so they choose him to be the Pope. So as you lead up to Leo, and then Julius and Leo, each one of these choices they make has to do with solving now long gone schism, unifying the church, organizing the church offices in Rome, making the finances work, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's how this man is chosen, is that he's from this circle, small circle of cardinals. So you get chosen from among the cardinals. You all know that. Each pope gets chosen from among the cardinals. You don't just go out and choose, you know, the governor of Louisiana to be the next pope. You have to be from the College of Cardinals. So these men have all been cardinals. Sometimes they've been cardinal for a long time. Leo had been a cardinal, even though he's a pretty young man, he had been a cardinal 20 years. So, you know, he very young. He was a teenager when he was nominated to be a cardinal. Well, that was just a payoff to the Medici family. That was ridiculous. But it didn't make any difference because he's going to have a 20-year education on the church. He's going to be a cardinal. So that's how he gets to be pope. 
Now, you know, theoretically, you'd think two men from this brilliant family, Pope Leo and later Pope Clement, would two, be two of the most brilliant popes. And you know the, the truth? They were two of the absolute worst popes in history. Of all the popes, they're two of the absolute worst. Brilliant educations, brilliant family, wonderful people supporting them from their brothers and sister, and terrible, terrible popes. So how about that? Think about that during the break, right? When you get your cookies and your wine and your all that stuff. Melissa, think about that. Help us, help us explain that puzzle. It's got something to do with the Renaissance. It's got something to do about the Renaissance uh, in Italy not noticing representation and, and you know, popular participation. I didn't really notice that. The Medici were certainly not particularly in favor of a whole lot of popular participation in things. Let's look at our people at home. One of our students is saying, well, the Pope probably wondered why he should engage with some obscure monk in Wittenberg. They were pretty successful in dealing with heresies up to this time. Yes, that's absolutely right. Although, all they had to do was talk to the head of the Augustinian order, you know, all the Pope had to do was pick up his phone and call the Augustinian order head and say, "What? who is this guy? Uh, he's a professor at your university there in Wittenberg, so who is he? And the person would have said to him, oh, he's one of the brightest men in the Augustinian order, you should talk to him. Roger, a very, very good point. Roger's saying that, yes, the printers are printing all this material, but somebody is carrying them, somebody is presenting them, somebody is making sure they get circulated, and you're absolutely right. Some of them are going to carry them across the channel, personally, in a boat, and get them into England, and then go around and circulate it. So you're exactly right. There, there are people. Yes, yes, that's a good point, that there were reformers in all these countries that had been there for decades of different kinds and different, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, church connections. So, for example, in England, uh, Wycliffe, W-I-C-L-I-F-F, -F, Wycliffe had uh, preached in the late 1300s, so just before 1400, that we don't need the Pope. So somebody had already said this. And he had followers in England who became known as the Lollards. And they all knew what he'd said. He was dead and gone, but everybody knew. And that group continues all through the 1400s. And they're there in the early 1500s when the Lutheran tracts come into England. And they get them and they circulate them. So Henry VIII knew all about Luther's book and the Lollards, and the fact that it was circulating around in his country, and he didn't like it, even though you know later he's going to uh, adopt basically a reformed church. But that's only to get a divorce. He didn't do that because he's devoted to Luther. Joel's asking about the Duke of Saxony and, and Luther's protection. Yes, the Duke of Saxony is the magic. He's the person who is protecting Luther. He will be at the Diet of Worms. He will have already put in practices to protect Luther, knowing that they're going to kidnap him. They, that's what they plan to do. The, the, the papal forces plan to kidnap him from the Diet of Worms. And so he, he's already planned on what to do. So you're absolutely right. It's, it's the Duke of Saxony that makes sure that Luther doesn't get snuffed out uh, and that the word goes out. And Roger's right. Uh, the word written down is circulating because there are already people in these places to help. And there were. There were, there were reform groups all over Europe, in France and Czechoslovakia, and all around. Rita Hortaguchi wants to know, shows other things in the church, Luther's but was it common practice? Yes, she's asking about all those other papers that were on the church. Yes, exactly, good point, Rita, calling it to our attention. Yes, it was normal in a university town for students, people, uh, monks, priests, lecturers to post ideas on these uh, church doors or university doors and then responses to be posted and more to be. Now with there was printing, there were, now there were uh, competing theses being printed and circulated and argued. And then they would have a formal disputation. So that it would be scheduled 
uh, at the university by maybe the city or by the university dean and they would invite uh, Professor Luther to come and argue his points and then they would invite Professor uh, you know, Archbishop from uh, Frankfurt would come and argue the other side. And, and this was happening here too. This is going to go on during the next four years from 1517 to 1521. Luther will argue repeatedly in different safe venues uh, to, to take this all on. So yes, yes, this was very normal. It went back the Middle Ages to medieval universities. You know, the medieval universities were very open to argument and disputation because they were all organizations of the students. And if you, if you fooled around with them, they'd pack up and take the university to another town. That's exactly what happened in Bologna. Uh, the Bologna city started to fool around with taxes a little bit like we've got our San Francisco city fooling around with taxes. And so the university uh, students said, okay, we'll take our university somewhere else. And they packed up on enough of them and went to Padova and started a new university, which now is the number one university in Italy. 